everything that Brother Rick says. Dear Lord, we thank you for the singing. We thank you for the preaching. We thank you that we have a place that we can gather. Dear Lord, be with us. I want to tell you that I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me to Psalm 85. Psalm 85. And um, I have to admit, I, I've read the Psalms a whole lot in my lifetime. Never did a, I never did a study in the Psalms until now. And, um, and I, but I'll tell you, uh, I, I've absolutely enjoyed myself. Amen. Amen. Uh, and I, I, I'm, like I said, I can have a good time with somebody or by myself. I'd lot rather have one with somebody. And, uh, and so I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am. Amen. So let's read this psalm here, Psalm 85. And uh, then uh, we'll make a few observations tonight. Hopefully we'll get to everything I want to. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it a little bit earlier, so what we normally do. So we'll, 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 we'll see, okay? It says in verse 1 of Psalm 85, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Now you might want to underline that. That gives us a clear understanding of when this psalm perhaps was written. Thou hast forg forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. And then we have that, that, that word there, Selah, which is stop, think about what I just said. <coughs> thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned <coughs> thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger to, toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and his work and his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in, their, in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Very interesting phrase. Now you want to underline that phrase. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. The sort of subtitle that I've given to this psalm here is a prayer for revival. A prayer for revival. This psalm is written, no doubt, a little after the return from Babylon. The Jews have been in Babylon, Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Now they're going back to the land. And the psalmist here is praying for a revival amongst God's people. And, and so and we, we see that right there. We have brought back the captivity of Jacob. And uh, that's kind of... So here's the setting that we have. Now, we read this psalm. You heard me read it. You read it as I, as I read it. And we see sort of here a note of praise. Okay, you've, re, you've brought back the captivity of Jacob. You've forgiven of thy people. Uh, I've taken away thy wrath. And then at the end, righteousness shall go before him and shall set us up the way of his steps. And So you see a note of praise in this psalm. You, you see a note of praise. But also, remember, when the Jews first went back to the land, on the one side of things, it's a remarkable fact of restoration 
that God kept His Word through Daniel and Jeremiah the prophets that He was going to allow His people to return back to the land. On the other side, they're saying, okay, oh, we've got one side, we're back in our land. and You know, it's always good to go back, you know, to where you were from. You know, when I go back to my hometown where I was raised, I, I don't say I, I wasn't born there. Goodness, I go back to where I was born. Don't, don't, they, don't, they don't even recognize me. They don't even recognize the way I talk. So nobody up there knows me. And, uh, but when I go back to Sanford, North Carolina, where I was raised, Things have changed there so much, it, you know, but it's still something about just treading the roads that you learn to drive on. It, there's something about that. There's something about going by the school that you attended. It's just something about that. You know, I, I spent, you know, f- you know, four years in that high school. Go by to the junior school. I spent so many years in that school, you know. And, um, and, and you know, it's, there's something about all that. And I looked back and went back and saw some of the places where I lived. And brought back memories. And, uh, but, and that's what's happening here. You've got, on the first initial return to Jerusalem, when the Jews got out of captivity, it's estimated that a total of about 50,000 people went back. Now, a lot of Jews de- determined to stay in Babylon, unfortunately. But many went back. And when they went back, they're glad at one, on the one side, as I said, that God's letting them to go back in their land after 70 years of captivity. But on the other other hand, they're standing in the midst of rubble everywhere. I mean, destruction. As far as the eye can see, the temple's gone. The walls of Jerusalem are destroyed. The gates are burning. It's destruction. But yet they have a note of praise in the midst of all destruction. It's kind of interesting. Because as they walk upon the heaps of of rubble and they see the temple laying in ruins, and this is the very early days of the return as they go back into this. There's two two, uh, major sections of this psalm. And you can divide them up. and, and, And you really see it. And uh, from verses 1, 2, and 3, I would say, is one section. And then uh, you know, from that point on is a, sec- is a second section. You have a note of gladness, and then you have a note of sort of gloom as they look back on what has happened and what possibly could happen. And we can learn from that. So let's look at, first of all, the request that the psalmist makes. Starting, standing in the midst of the rubble, destruction of the promised land everywhere. The first note that we see of this psalm, Lord, thou has been favorable unto thy land. How can you stand in a land that has been totally destroyed and say, God, Lord, you've been favorable unto thy land. That's kind of a note of praise. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. That's why. Because you kept your word, Lord. You took us into captivity, and now you brought us back to our homeland. You've let us come back. So that's the first note that we see here. And one of the things I want to be, and I think what we can learn from that from an application standpoint, is what the Bible teaches us over in the book of, uh, in the book of James chapter number one and this is something that people don't like to hear and it's not it's something that none of us like to hear because it, it, it's tough because in verse two of chapter one of James James chapter one verse two James writes to us and he says my brethren count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation now, how in the world, how in the world, as my, as my kids would say, what the world? I mean, Lord, what you trying to tell me count it all joy when I'm in a for temptation? Because then he goes to verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Don't ever pray for patience unless you get ready for being tried. 
Because verse 3 is true. You pray for patience, trying is coming. Because the only way to get patience is to go through trials. And you'll learn it sooner or later. Trust me. I messed up one time and prayed for patience. I should have known better. I should have known better. But uh, I prayed for I said, Lord, I need patience. And whoo, did the trials come. And then, through, then my, my prayer changed through all that. I said, Lord, I'm hard-headed. And I don't learn too quick. Lord, please let me learn this lesson quick. <laughs> let me learn it. I mean, I was praying, Lord, teach me quick. Drill a hole and pour it in so I can get this, this, this lesson down. Because we got to get, we got to, we got to quit this. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just one right after the other. But then, it, but it goes all down through James chapter 1 about that. And you can see these Jews standing in the midst of their homeland that's destroyed and telling the Lord, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought us the captivity, uh, brought back the captivity of Jacob. So the, praise God for his forgiveness. Because verse 2, thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. Thou hast forgiven. So in verse 1, you see the favor of God. You see how they see the favor of God. Not the wrath of God, but they see the favor of God. The land without the people is like a body without the soul. They were connected to that land. And they were glad to be back into the land. And, um, and he brought back, and I want you to notice something here. Even though Jacob sometimes is used as another word for Israel, it's kind of interesting. He says he brought back the captivity of Jacob, not Israel. He didn't say Israel. He said Jacob. And a lot of times you'll find that in the latter part, in the early part of the, of the early part of the captivity, uh, return of the captivity, and the latter part, you have a lot of mentions of, of Jacob, Judah. And you have, a, you know, it's the divided kingdom. Why? Because Jeremiah the prophet, who was, a, who was a contemporary with Daniel during the Babylonian captivity, you, you, you got to sort of put it on a timeline there. What happened in Jeremiah, we learn? Well, you had Israel. You had Judah. You had two nations, basically. You had the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. They both had their kings. But Israel and Judah both were in idolatry. They were both in, 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 a, in an unbelief, doing what God told them not to do. So what did God do? God destroyed Israel by using, and here's, here, here's trivia time, and who did, he, who did God use to destroy uh, Israel? Not, not, not Judah and Jerusalem, but Israel. What nation? that he used to destroy Israel. They were wicked people. Probably the most wicked people that probably have ever been on the face of the earth. They were atrocious in war. They, they were... The, the, the Geneva Convention would have never made it with, 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 with these, this group of folks because they didn't pay attention to anything. All was fair in them in war. They did everything. Huh? Wasn't the Philistines. Huh? Assyrians. He used the Assyrians to destroy Israel. But before he destroyed Israel, he tried to get them. He sent them prophets. He sent the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom prophets. He told them to get right, told them judgment was coming if they didn't get right. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, you know, the, the Bible tells us that God did, well, in Jeremiah, he tells us that God, and it's the only time it's mentioned, God divorced Israel. That's what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah said God divorced Israel. He cut them off. He let them go their own way. He allowed the Assyrians to come in and utterly destroy Samaria and Israel. But she had a sister that Jeremiah referred to as her treacherous sister. Judah. 
There's no mention in the Word of God that God ever divorced Ju Ju Judah or Jerusalem. So what God did to them was sent them in a 70-year captivity. That's what He did with them. And He used the Babylonians. Okay? So He used these people. All right? So now after that, they go back into the land. They see the favor of God. Jacob is weak, that is it, Judah. They, they're, they're, they're in a weakened state. They see not only the favor of God, they see the forgiveness of God. We read that in verse 2. And then uh, it's kind of amazing, the forgiveness of God right there. There's something here in verse 2. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. That phrase right there is a direct reference to the Day of Atonement. To the Day of Atonement. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, when the high priest would do what he did, and that was the whole high holy day, there were two goats involved. Two goats on the Day of Atonement. They had a ceremony. Now this was to cover the sins of the, of the, of the nation for one year. Till the next day of atonement, day of atonement. One of those goats was called the scapegoat. Okay? The other goat was slain. The scapegoat, all the sin of the land was placed on that scapegoat's head. He was given to a what they referred to as a fit, F-I-T, man, that would lead that goat way out into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere and turn him loose. And that was symbolic that the sins of Israel were, I mean, of Judah were covered for a period of the year. That, was, that, that, that goat took them away, wandered, and had, had, they ate in the land. The other goat was slain. And the blood was taken by the high priest into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the Shekinah glory for uh, seven times to complete the ceremony there in the thing. So the, in this, sin was concealed. Picture it now. Concealed. It was covered up. Atonement. That's what I'm talking about. The, the, that word atonement, Brother Mike, you and I were talking about. It means covering. It means satisfaction. It means uh, concealment. That's what, it, that, that's what that word means. And uh, for in the Old Testament, for a period of a year. But praise God, when Jesus Christ went to the cross and He atoned for our sins, being the great high priest, He went into heaven and did the high priestly ministry in heaven once and forever. It's not an every year thing. It was done once and for it. It's done. Amen. And so the sins of the scapegoat carried away. The slain goat covered up. So we got carried away and covered up in the sin. And that's verse 2. We see thou hast forgiven the iniquity of, our, of the, thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Calvary carried away our sins, covered up our sins, and willed our sins out of existence. You got to, there's a difference in the cross and the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. There's a big difference. Our sins on the cross, what did He do? The Bible says in the book of Colossians that He took the handwritten of ordinances that were against us and took them out of the way, nailing them to His cross. They've been taken away from us. they never to be brought back again. Amen. Covered up once and for all by an omniscient and by an omnipotent God. Go over to Jeremiah the prophet and let's look at a, 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 a verse there. I'll tell you what, no, time just goes by fast. I like this. I want to get there. I, want to get, I get excited and want to tell you all stuff. And I can't get there fast enough. Now I may have to wait all the way next week. Maybe not, though. 
Jeremiah 31, verse 34. That ain't, yeah, 31, 34. I started to say, uh, I might have messed up. In verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So now you see where the psalmist is going in Psalm 85. Okay? Because then the psalmist not only talks about the favor of God, the forgiveness of God. He talks about the fury of God. In verse 3, he says, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. You know, Israel had, or, and Judah, Judah had gone through some wicked reigns. When I saw that, they had some wicked kings. Ahaz, wicked, wicked. Followed by, you remember who followed Ahaz? Anybody have a clue? We talked about him in the Psalms a little bit. I'll give you a hint of who this king was. He made a special prayer in the Scriptures and asked God for 15 more years. Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the king after Ahaz. Now Hezekiah was a godly king. Judah experienced revival of sorts under Hezekiah. And uh, then you had the horrible reign after Hezekiah of a king by the name of Manasseh. And under Manasseh, because Manasseh reigned 50 years, and he was horrible. He was wicked. He took the nation back into idolatry and back worse than they'd ever been. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, he was doing child sacrifice. I mean, anything, all the evils we have right now, they were under Hezekiah's reign. It was, it was horrible. I mean, sexual exploitation of children. And so what the psalmist is doing here, thou hast taken away all thy wrath, Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. See, they're going back, he's going back remembering those horrible years and how they were in unbelief and how God, you know, put them in captivity. And basically the psalmist has said, thank you for bringing back to our land. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you that you're not continuing to pour out your fury upon us because of our past sin. That's what the psalmist is doing here. And so not only does he pray for that, but in verses 4 through 7, he praying for God's not only forgiveness, but fullness. He wants more than this. Look at verse 4. He says, turn us. Boy, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty significant. Turn us. When you, when you think about Christianity, you think about salvation, you think about revival, you think about... Okay, you went into captivity because of your idolatry and God's whipping you because you were bad. And then this psalmist says, I thank you, thank you that your anger's gone and you forgive us and, you, and we got your favor. Turn us. What is the psalmist asking for? And he says, turn us, O God of our salvation. When he says turn us, what word comes to your mind that we have to do in order to get saved? What word? Repent. Right. Because repent means what? Turn. That's what it means. It means to turn around and go the opposite direction, right? And so the psalmist is saying, Lord, don't just give us your favor. Don't just give us your forgiveness. Don't just give us, you know, not pour out your fury of your anger. But Lord, give us, make us repentful. Turn us. So you see that here. O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. He knew that if we, the people would repent, God, and, and I tell you, I got some good stuff coming up, man. I'm telling you, I want to skip over that so bad, I don't know what to do. And, uh, but it, it's just good stuff. I have a good time with this. I don't know if y'all have a good time, I do, but I have a good time with it. 
Okay? And, uh, but there's a change in tone here in verse 4. Turn us. And um, so we have a national repentance that is needed. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. Turn us as a nation. And, um, and you know, repentance toward God. Acts chapter 20, verse 21, repentance toward God. They, want, they needed repentance. Not only a national repentance, but a national revival is needed. Look at verse 6 and 7. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Verse 7. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. National revival was needed. Now, what is revival? Revival is a mighty work of the Spirit that can't be explained. It's not this junk you see it on TV now. I was watching something this past week on YouTube or something. There's these people, nutcase folk, barking like dogs, walling in the floor, shaking, quivering, uh, dancing around like they're in convulsions. That's not revival. That has never been marked in the Holy Scriptures or in the past when the movements of God had hit whatever in the Welsh revivals and, the, and, and then the three revivals that our country has had called the Three Great Awakenings. None of that was characterized in those revivals. But yet that's what you got this nutcase group now out there. I ain't kidding you. They bark like dogs. They get up and <laughs> say that's the Holy Spirit. I mean... They got something, but it wasn't, it wasn't the Lord, okay? I don't know. They might have ate too much pizza the night before, but it's, just, it's, just not, it's not God, all right? And there's a difference between a reformation and a revival. Now, back in the 15, about 15, 1600s of, this, of, of history, we saw the Protestant Reformation. Now, understand something about the Protestant Reformation. Now, first of all, I want to make, make clear, if you don't know this, you need to know this. And if you don't know why, you need to read why. Baptists are not Protestants. Okay? The Baptists did not protest anything. Okay? You had people within the Catholic Church that did not agree with what was going on in the Catholic Church. They saw the corruption of penances and what they were doing, selling of indulgences, and it was led by a priest, Martin Luther, who was a priest in the Catholic Church. Martin Luther had no desire to destroy the Catholic Church. He had no desire to come out of the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. That's what he wanted to do. So a refer for a reformation is a change of outward actions. A revival brings about inward change. When the Lord works in your heart and brings about change, not what a reformation will bring, outward change. Now, revival will bring about an outward change, but it will be because of an inward change. So, Judah had seen their share of revivals. You go back again. The psalmist is thinking about this. Will that, notice he didn't say without not revive your people. Period. He said without not revive us what? Again. Implying that he, they had been revived before. When? Well I told you about one. Remember Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly king. And that's the reason when he got sick of whatever sickness he had, he prayed and he asked God for 15 more years because of what God was doing in the nation. He says, don't stop it now. Let me continue on. And God granted it. So the nation of Judah had a wonderful revival under Hezekiah. And then there was another king by the name of Jehoshaphat. And he gets under, under the radar a lot. But Jehoshaphat, he was a godly king that led the nation of Judah to uh, some revival. 
And then you had a, 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 another king that was young. Remember the king Josiah. Josiah led the king, nation of Israel, I mean to, of Judah, excuse me, to revival. So they had had their shares of revival. And so the people are saying, or the psalmist is saying, okay, here's our request. Will you not revive us again that thy people may rejoice? Show us your mercy. Give us your salvation. I, and then in verse 8, uh, he says, I will hear what the, God will, what the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Now, verse 8 is sort of another, I'm not even going to get into it tonight. Because I'm not going to be able to do it justice. I'm not going to get into it tonight. Because getting into some good stuff right now. And I, and I want to, but we're going to be here at 9 o'clock. we stay here. I mean, I mean yeah, 9 o'clock. But I won't keep you. But, uh, I, but I want you to read from verse 8 to verse 13. And I want you to see here. We're going to talk about the... I'm going to give you, what, I'm going to give you some ideas of what to look for. We're going to talk about the Shekinah glory. Now remember there were three prophets, I talked about two, that were contemporary with uh, the Babylonian captivity and it, Judah's plight. One was Jeremiah, we've talked about that. We've talked about Daniel. The other one was Ezekiel. Okay, you got to keep these prophets in when they, were, when they prophesied and who they prophesied to. Ezekiel had a vision that was probably in the Old Testament one of the saddest visions that a prophet could have. Now, I'm going to let you look that up as to what that was, okay? Probably out of any prophet, Ezekiel saw the saddest vision that a prophet had to see. And uh, now Jeremiah is known uh, as the weeping prophet, but I imagine Ezekiel had his share of, of weeping too. Okay, we know we know Ezekiel by the wheel. That's how that's what what we know about Ezekiel, the wheel in the in the valley of dry bones. We we that's what we know of Ezekiel. But Ezekiel probably perhaps again, and I'm going to emphasize it. He probably saw the saddest vision of any prophet in the Old Testament, probably. Okay. And then when you go on down and read down here, I want you to pay close attention to verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. And then I requested that song tonight when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. There's a phrase in that song that goes with verse 10, verse 10. Try to figure out what that is. Okay? I'm just giving you some odd things to look for and think about. Okay? All right? I want to give it to you so bad I don't know what to do, but I, I, I just ain't going to do it. I'm, just, I'm trying to whet your appetite so you go back and look for it. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay? And, uh, and then next week, we'll come in here and look. And we're going to talk about the Shekinah glory. We're going to talk about Ezekiel. We're going to talk about that mercy and truth are met together. And what the psalmist reply or God's reply was from the request of the psalmist. Okay? So we looked at the request. Now we're going to see the reply next time. Let's go to the Lord prayer. Father, love you. Thank you. That, Lord, you've allowed us to be here tonight. Thank you for your word. I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to be faithful. And, Lord, as we leave here tonight, bring us back our next appointed time. That, Lord, we may please you and serve you in all that we do. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.